This video is brought to you by Aralik, makers of the Vega G 2.1 streaming deck. Click to aralik.com for more information. David Bowie's Station to Station on CD. This is not the remaster that was done a few years ago, neither is it the remaster done by Virgin in 99. This is the 1991 remaster that was put out on Ryko. Remember this because I'm coming back to it. Today we are talking about some loudspeakers made here in Berlin, about four kilometers from here. They come from Head Audio, H-E-double-D. This is called the Type 7, but it's the Mark II version come to the Mark II bit in a moment, but we've got an AMT tweeter, which sort of squeezes air rather than pushes it from a soft dome. Seven inch mid bass driver. Inside we've got, because it's an active speaker, we've got a hundred watt class D ice power for this driver, hundred watt class D ice power for this driver. The crossover is now done in DSP. So at the heart of this speaker is DSP. If we feed it an analog input that gets encoded to 32-bit 96 by an A to D converter upon entry, process then out. But you might think that the volume control is done in the digital domain. It's not, it's analog. It comes after the DACs inside here. Now, as this is kind of like a pro audio monitor, and I've done a video about this before. These fit very nicely in a home environment. There is no real difference between a pro audio monitor and a home loudspeaker. And we could debate this endlessly for days for people who want to kind of talk about accuracy, but I'm not going to go there today. What I do want to talk about is something called the linearizer. Now the linearizer was a plugin that ran on a PC or a Mac that your digital audio workstation or playback software talked to. And what it did is it time aligned the outputs of these two drivers. Because there's DSP inside here now, Head have put the linearizer inside the speaker. What does time alignment mean? Well, it means that all of the frequencies leave the speaker at the same time, because believe it or not, in traditional speakers, that doesn't happen. So what Head have done is they've linearized the group delay here, which I think is a good thing. However, it does introduce a small delay in the output of the speakers. So there are a whole bunch of crazy switches on the back here. You can turn the linearizer off for when you're watching TV. So when I run my Xiaomi Mi Box S TV streamer into my preamp and then into these, I turn the linearizer off watching TV to make sure that I've got proper lip sync, you know, in a movie or a Netflix show. Yeah, maybe I can show you them. If I just quickly turn the speaker without dropping it. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> it looks quite daunting, doesn't it? But over time, you, you get used to what each one does. And there's some very powerful stuff here, as we will see. But first, I want to talk about the sound quality of these loudspeakers. Now the Type 7 Mark II's strongest suit is dynamics. Both micro, smaller, macro, bigger. This is an excellent performer at low volume levels. Their second strongest suit comes from the AMT tweeter. It is both simultaneously clear, transparent, and silky. And that in turn means it's big on delicacy, finesse, those kinds of qualities. And it's never ever over present etched or too insistent and this is where the bowie comes in this remaster of station to station is i hate to say it it's quite bright and the track here stay with the enormous guitar solos on it really can make it can make you wince on 
pretty much most other hi-fi systems, including the Kef LS50 Wireless 2, which I'll come to later. These speakers do not do that. They do not make me wince when I'm playing Stay from this particular master. I know that's pretty granular, but as I've said before, the mastering quality of music matters far more than the delivery container. So that's just, you know, if you're playing this from an MP3, it'll still make you wince as if you played it in iRes, it doesn't really matter. The master is, yeah, it's a little bit toppy. This speaker is very detailed. It does tease out a lot of the, the smaller bits of information buried in a recording. I'm sure that's to do with the AMT tweeter. But it's also somewhat relaxed. So if we compare it to say the Kef LS50 Wireless 2, this is more of a lean back speaker. You kind of just sink into it, you go, ah. Whereas the LS50 Wireless 2 is more of a lean forward, edgy your seat, more of a thrilling listen. I think this is much more conducive to long term listening. And that's probably a deliberate design decision made by Klaus Heinz, who is the founder of Head Audio. In, in that he knows that this is going to go into studios where people are doing mixing and mastering sessions for hours and hours and hours and hours. You don't want a speaker that's tiring. This is not a tiring speaker. Neither are they boring. They sort of tread that line just nicely. More thoughts on these compared to the LS50 Wireless 2 from Kef. The, the mid-range here is more dynamic than the Kef and the head sound bigger. And they're probably designed for larger rooms more so than the LS50 Wireless 2. So if your room is small, you probably want the Kef still. But with slightly sort of medium sized rooms, I don't know what a medium sized room is, but if you think your room is medium to large, this might be a better fit for you. And that includes the head's more impactful low end. It's not quite as tight as the Kef, but it, it does seem to be more, I guess, voluptuous. <laughs> voluptuous. But the Type 7 aren't quite as crisp in their image lock as the LS50 Wireless 2. And also, and maybe this is common to a lot of sort of pro audio studio monitors, I'm not sure. These speakers, if you put your ear up close, you can hear a hiss. And I don't get that from the Kefs. But Klaus Heinz has engineered into these speakers something very clever indeed. Head audio call it COP, which means closed or ported. You can see we've got two bass reflex ports here. Head also supply in the box these sort of bungs. They're like a solid plastic with a, a foam surround. And we can pop them into here and seal these off. And they now become a sealed loudspeaker. Make sure you put them in the right way with the hole facing outwards because we have to use a tool like this, screw it in there, and then pull them out if we want to. However, a lot of speaker manufacturers supply port bungs with their loudspeakers. But what Head have done is also quite clever because they give us an option to change the filter and to implement that again DSP, we click this one over to here to the COP setting here. So the filter settings inside the speaker have now changed to accommodate the fact that it's a sealed box. Why would you do this? Well, I think, you know, I was playing um, Alessandro Cortini's latest album and with these sealed, you just get a little bit more mid-range clarity. There isn't as much push in the bottom end. So with that Cortini album, the, the bass isn't quite as voluptuous. From an engineering point of view, Klaus Heinz says that the sealed implementation of these speakers provides a better impulse response from the speaker. But it might not sound as satisfying to you. The point is we have the choice to decide for ourselves. Personally, I prefer the sealed mode. didn't think that the Kef KC62 was going to be the only subwoofer I talked about this year because Head sent me their Base 8 subwoofer unit. You can probably see it behind me here, the big black thing on the floor. So I'm just going to put this back where it should be and then we can talk more about the sub. First, you can see that it's ported but it also has the COP port bungs 
stuck in because you can run that one closed or ported. And if I'm running the mains closed, I need to run the subwoofer closed. The sub has an eight inch driver. Inside there are 300 watts of ice power class D amplification. There is also DSP inside. Why DSP inside? Well, according to Klaus Heinz, the problem with subs is that lower frequencies are generally slower than higher frequencies. So what he's done with the DSP is he is delaying the analog output that goes to the mains loudspeakers. So what I've got set up here in the hi-fi rack, I've got a Vinnie Rossi Leo running as a preamp. It's coming balanced out of the back of that, going balanced in to the back of the sub into its analog inputs. The sub then is filtered at 80 hertz, but then it has an analog output on the back of the sub, which then goes into the left and right loudspeakers so that the sub is low pass filtered and the mains, the Type 7, are high pass filtered. This seems to be a bit of a, a theme for me this year, high pass filtering the mains. We'll come back to this in a moment. So because the sub is delaying its analog outputs, the analog outputs that go to the Type 7, it means that the entire system, the complete system, sub and satellites, is 100% time aligned. That's assuming that you have the sub, as I do, on the same plane as the loudspeakers. If you can't do that, if you have to bring it further forward or further back, there is a compensation switch on the back of the sub that will adjust the delay of its output accordingly. So if we move the sub up to two meters behind the mains, the Type 7, we can adjust the setting on the back of the sub to delay the mains even more. Or alternatively, if we bring it up to two meters in front of the mains, we can delay the mains less using that same switch on the back of the sub. So wherever we put our sub, plus or minus two meters from the speaker plane, we can maintain a fully time aligned sub sat system. I think that's pretty cool. One more thing that is not in the manual that I had to dig out from Dimitri, who also works at Head, who is a massive techno fan. He told me that you have to bump the gain on the mains plus 3 dB to ensure that the loudness of those mains correlates with what's coming out of the sub. So the base 8 unit is rated by Head down to 24 hertz, but it's 3 dB down at 24 hertz. So it doesn't go as low on paper as the KEF KC62. My sort of non-scientific analysis of the way the sub sounds, it's not as muscular, as taut as the KC62. It's a bit, it's a bit looser. And I also think that the KC62 is much better in small rooms, but wouldn't be, well, wouldn't be as effective in medium to larger rooms. Whereas I think the base eight would scale better you remember when I did my KC62 video that I had to put the sub, the little, little KEF thing, between the loudspeakers, like equidistant from each loudspeaker, to get a wall of sound. So to provide the illusion that the bass is coming from the loudspeakers. I don't have to do that with the bass 8, which is a good job because it doesn't really sit so nicely in the middle between my loudspeakers here. It's off to one side. And even though it is off to one side, I still get this amazing wall of sound. It does sound like the bass is coming from the loudspeakers. This is the illusion. This is the, the wonder, I think, really, of adding a sub is having this amazing wall of sound. And I think that wall of sound from the heads is bigger than we get from the LS50 Wireless 2 with the KC62. It's sort of bigger in all directions, but maybe not depth, because the LS50 Wireless 2 are excellent with soundstage depth, and I don't think the Type 7 with this sub are quite there. Not quite. But one thing that is again evident with this head loudspeaker system, this subsat system, is that the high pass filter on the Type 7 does undoubtedly improve the mid range presence and dynamics and pop of those satellite loudspeakers because they're not being asked to do low bass. The sub is doing that for us, crossed over at 80 hertz. So again, my message is that, yes, it's great to integrate a subwoofer in your system, but it's even better when you have a high pass filter available to you for your mains.
One thing that we don't get from this head system that we do get from the Kev system is, is streaming, source selection, and volume control. And that means we need to feed the head with a preamp that has volume control and source selection. Now, the thing is, you can connect a AES EBU digital signal to the heads in the back. You can do it through the sub as well. So you can have an all digital chain. But I really don't know, and I certainly don't have, a digital preamp with an AES EBU output that also does volume control. Now, why does that really matter? Because, well, there is volume control on the back of each speaker, but imagine having to kind of turn each one up and down every time you want to change the volume. No. So I used two different source boxes, if you like, in listening to these, and actually it really reminded me of the value of having a high-end preamplifier. I started out with the RME ADI FS2 DAC. It's got balanced outs. Goes into the head system. And it sounds great and very detailed and very quick silvery and very fast. But when I cut over to the Vinnie Rossi Leo and used its balanced outputs, volume control in solid state mode, the, the sound just fattens up. It chunks up. It puts on a bit of weight. It's not quite as fast, but I much, much prefer it with the Vinnie Rossi. Now, obviously, that you know, adding a pre is going to add to the total system cost. My recommendation at the entry level for preamps would be something from Shit Audio, specifically the Freya. I actually didn't use it for this system, but you could. So that's a $1,000 preamp. Now, obviously, there's a DAC in the Vinnie Rossi Leo. There's, there's a DAC inside the RME. But the differences in preamp quality from each really puts any concerns about double dacking in its place. So the preamp differences are up here and pretty much obliterate any worries about double dacking because that's down here as far as I'm concerned. Because the differences between the preamp feeds is significant. And I don't think the studio guys are going to be all that anal retentive about having two DACs in their playback chain, especially when the speakers resolve very, very, very clearly what goes before them. And of course, having an analog preamp feed these head type 7 and the base 8 means we can bring vinyl into the picture. So comparing the head system with the KEF LS50 Wireless 2 KC62 system, it's pretty much like the differences between the two loudspeakers. The head sounds bigger, it sounds more relaxed, it's more easeful, you can sort of sink back into it. Whereas the KEF has a, a greater sense of urgency. I just rocked my chair there. It has a greater sense of urgency, it really wants to kind of grab you by the lapels and force you to listen. And the, the head system doesn't work like that, it's just, it's much more easy going. And I also think, again, as per the loudspeaker differences, the head system would work better in larger rooms than the KEFs. So if you don't like the fact that the KEF system is a completely sealed system, there's no, well you can, there is an analog input on the back of one speaker, but it, it does feel like it's more closed off and everything's very much app based. If you want to sort of break out of the app world, you want to choose your own, you want to choose your own DAC and your pre and your phono stage and things like that, the head give us much more flexibility in, in that regard. And they also give us flexibility in whether we want to run the whole system ported or closed. I think that's absolutely fantastic and very original, actually. And the sub setup could not be easier. You just click two switches on the back of the, well, one on the back of the sub and one on the back of each loudspeaker, and you're up and running with an 80 hertz crossover. Super simple. <laughs> audio speaker sub investigation plus the earlier KEF sub investigation has really realigned 
my audio priorities, or the list of audio priorities. It used to run room, speakers, amp, DAC. And now it runs room, speakers, sub, amp, DAC. That's of course if you want to integrate a sub, but I think it makes an enormous difference, far greater than the amplifier or the DAC. So I think it's terrific that HEAD offer us a solution. So the speakers are 1600 a pair, the base eight is a thousand euros. If we add in, say, the shit Freya Plus, that takes us to 3700, which gives us 300 for a streamer and a DAC. So we might go Raspberry Pi and then something like a Dragonfly or the, the THX DAC, the dongle DAC, something like that. And then we're at four grand, which is exactly the same price as putting LS50 Wireless 2 with KC62 in the world of KEF. So, you know, we're at the same sort of price level when we consider the complete system, but we get more flexibility here, which I think is a good thing for many people who don't like the very sort of sealed system nature of streaming speakers that KEF make. So I'm, yeah, I'm super impressed with this head system. I find it very, very easy to live with. I would say that I could live with it longer term than the LS50 Wireless 2 and the KC62. I think it's just easier and more easy going, more relaxed. Yeah, it just, it has that, yeah, that lean back factor, which I really, really do enjoy in the long haul. Anyway, if you like this video, please hit the like button down below. If you like my attitude towards high-end audio in that I'm happy to, you know, investigate what are traditionally pro audio studio speakers, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. My voice is going. Thank you.